Okay, we're recording to the cloud. We um, are recording to the cloud, so there's no going back. It's yeah, it's begun. It's it it, it has begun as 2021 has begun. Uh, long time no talk. Happy New Year. We Happy were New Year. we were on vacation there for a minute, not really planned, but also at the same time was kind of like you know what? It's the holidays and everyone's doing stuff and. Now I kind of understand where like all these podcasts I've listened to for years that take off like two months, you know, during the holidays, like December and January. And I'm always like, what the hell guys, I need stuff to listen to. And now I get it. Yeah. I mean, this is the time of year that I would be, I, I literally uh, download podcasts and listen to them while I'm in the kitchen cooking, whether it's Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner or you know, the, it just, you just have the podcast going through all the ones that you hadn't listened to. So yeah, right. it's, it's been a drought, so most definitely. And now we're, and now we're responsible for the drought. Yeah, because we're we're part of a uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. Pod, Pottern family. Po oh, 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 <laughs> clever you. So, uh, anything new on your front? Uh, well, I think we've been just we, you know, obviously the stuff we didn't mention one time uh, was Cobra Kai's out. Yes. Yes, Cobra were you, Kai. Were you, Cobra Kai is out. I've been trying to avoid uh, Twitter for a little bit because, as we discussed, I've been trying to uh, start over from season one because I'm here with family watching it. So I haven't watched season three outside of the first episode. Got You've been it. binge watching, yes? Yes. So I hadn't watched it at all uh, up until season three came out. You've been trying to get me to watch it for years. Very generously offered me your YouTube account back when it started on uh, the YouTube show. <laughs> And I think I was hesitant not, and here's the thing for people that don't know, but shouldn't be surprised is I am a die hard Karate Kid fan. Uh, the original trilogy I've watched dozens of times. And I don't mean just like put it on and walk away and do other stuff. Like I'll sit and watch all three movies anytime anybody wants to. And yes, yeah. the martial arts do not hold or stand the test of time. The martial arts sequences that is. But in my opinion, you know, the Karate Kid is one of the greatest martial arts films ever made, without a it's doubt. Agreed. Fant yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, you, ha you have one of the best, I don't, I don't want to say sports films director. Yeah, John G. Hamilton, and for sure he did Rocky. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, 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 his work is fantastic. His work, is, he is a cultural icon. Yeah. And he captured, he captured the American spirit both within Rocky and within the Karate Kid uh, and then, you first know, two the films. Screen, screen writer wise, you have Robert Mark Kamen, who is a martial artist himself, and hence where there's that level of authenticity uh, to the script. But we digress. We, we can talk about the Karate Kid some other time, but I love- This is breaking news, by the way. Say what? Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about breaking news. Yeah, uh, I love Cobra Kai. I just get so invested in it though. It's like, I get so amped up that when we watch it late at night, you know, I have to make sure and finish on an appropriate episode because if it's any sort of cliffhanger, I'm like, we got to watch another one. Because I've been, I'll yeah. literally wake up in the middle of the night like, oh, what happened? You know, like, what's going to happen? So either which way, that's that's new here. We also uh, finished uh, season one and two of The Mandalorian, which I highly oh, recommend. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Have you seen it? No, not at all. Great, great fight scenes in it also in that one. You know, okay. uh, obviously as he is the Mandalorian in all his armor, he's not as agile, but he does a lot of great, uh, uh, just very straightforward fighting stuff. So, and wonderful series. Uh, John Favreau obviously runs that one. So it's great. Uh, and we finally it's, started, go ahead. It's appropriate that we're talking about uh, the Mandalorian because Carl Weathers is in that. And yesterday was his birthday. And I know he is probably listening to this very oh. episode right now. 100%. I mean, he's been on my ass about why we haven't been recording more episodes. Yeah, uh, he's actually live on the call right now. We just block his camera and <laughs> mute him. So. Uh, yeah, uh, and then, uh, well, funny enough, I have a slight connection to him I'll mention here in a second. But also, we finally started season two of Warrior because I watched season one when it first came out, but Jessica wanted to watch it. So it was kind of you know, we were watching like one episode a week of that. So we finally started season two and it is very good. And although Cinemax, you know, canceled their television production, it's now streaming on HBO Max and it's like becoming one of the most binge watched shows on HBO Max. And so now there's all these articles popping up like, you know, 
like I just said, the most been watched show on HBO Max and the best show you're not watching on HBO Max. So we can only hope that all of this traction will get it a season three. And I can't see why not. It's constantly rated like one of the top shows of the year for both seasons. So hopefully it'll get picked up for a third season because so far the second season is fantastic. Yeah, and I, I currently don't have HBO Max. So I haven't I haven't ventured into season two. So uh, I gotta I gotta get on that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But uh, otherwise, other new news, the one thing I did yesterday, uh, which was super last second, literally about 10 minutes before I saw it online, I thought, oh, I guess I'll join this Zoom meeting was I sat in on a Zoom call with Al Dacascus and Ron Van Cleef, the Black Dragon. How did that happen? Uh, it, it literally, uh, Ron Van Cleef had posted on his Facebook or it was Al DeCosco's, I can't remember, because like a nerd, I follow both of them. And it was just Zoom call. Here's the meeting thing. Here's the password. Join in. And I thought there was going to be like hundreds of people in it. So uh, I figured you were working, which I assume you were working yesterday. I was. Yeah, unfortunately. But I randomly sent it to uh, my friend Tiger, who's also, do you know Tiger? He trains at House of Champions. I probably know him. Really, really. Yeah, I think you pointed out to him. Martial artist, Yeah. Either which way, because he's a, a nerd like us. I was like, dude, if you want to jump on this, so we get on there, and there's literally a total max at the most was like 15 people. Oh, that's and, a dream. Yeah, and they wanted all of our videos on so they could see us. And uh, it was there was like a moderator guy who I think is a student of Al DeCosco's, but otherwise it was just Al kind of interviewing uh, Ron Van Cleef. And it was nothing new I hadn't learned before, just because I'm a huge fan and I've watched all of his interviews and listened to his audio commentaries. But we got to interact with them and talk and ask questions and they, they wanted to know where each one of us was from. So we had to do like an introduction, like, Hi, I'm da, 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 da. and uh, it was just a little surreal. Right. And then uh, I also, at the end, only Tiger and I were the only ones that wanted to ask questions. So I got to ask him some questions about his career and this and that. And he was just super nice. I, I can't emphasize how nice the guy was. And like, he gave us all his personal email and we're like, Oh, okay. And uh, it's, it stinks though, because, you know, I'm a lifelong Dragon Fest attendee and 2019 was the first year that uh, I recall that he's attended, especially of the, the newer uh, version mm -hmm. of Dragon Fest, but it was the one year I didn't go because I was up fighting in Seattle with Sugarfoot. So I was like, no. So I told him that he's like, oh man, you got to tell PD I say hello, blah, blah, blah. So it was really cool. But uh, oh, that's really great. Yeah. So really, I mean, otherwise for me, I'm just buckled down, uh, training every day in my home gym where I'm sitting right now and uh, life's pretty good. I'm ready for, you know, this, this COVID thing to be over, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah, that's really, I'm glad you got to jump in on that. That's, that's really, uh, it's really special. It kind of, I don't know, I think uh, getting into something like that uh, doesn't just help ground us during this time of COVID, but uh -huh. it helps inspire us. Oh, so that, that's, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you got in on that. Yeah. And I mean, Ron Van Cleve is such an inspiration in the martial arts. I mean, he's uh, in his mid 70s or late 70s now, and he's mm -hmm. determined to get his Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. I think he's, he's a blue belt now or something. He's like, I'm going to get it. He's like, I might be 90 by the time I get it, but I'm going to get it. And he plans to that's start awesome. competing as soon as COVID's over. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's impressive. That's that's an inspiration right there. Uh, before we get into our episode and what it's about, though, uh, we should mention that, unfortunately, uh, our friends over the Dudes of Kung Fu podcast lost Big Sean. Uh, yeah. I'm a huge Dudes of Kung Fu uh, podcast fan. Sifu Alex was a very uh, special guest on our show. Uh, he kindly came on, and I unfortunately never had the chance to meet or talk with Big Sean. We were, uh, Sifu and Alex, I were planning to do a live commentary for a UFC event. Uh, and unfortunately that obviously never happened, but we want to send our condolences over to them, uh, Big Sean's family. And yeah, just really sad, sad news uh, to wake up to that day. So uh, the Dudes of Kung Fu podcast will pretty much be no more. They're going to do like a once a month Facebook type uh, live event, but otherwise Sifu Alex is now starting his own podcast, which I am very excited for and will help out in any way I can or forever asked to contribute. So uh, once again, our condolences to Big Sean Madigan's family and yeah. Yeah, I think I, there's nothing more to say about that. It's, just, it's really heartbreaking. 
Yeah. And he's, he's irreplaceable. So, I mean, you know, I know a lot of people are like, well, why can't you keep doing the show? But it's like Steve Alex said, no one can replace him. You could, you could try, but that was the magic of that show was him because he was such a unique individual and he was so deep and philosophical. Uh, it's funny though, your first time listening, like he's very brash, right? He's, you know, like a Brooklyn New Yorker, you know, like, Hey, I'll oh, fuck this guy. <laughs> but then his wisdom and his insight and his experience in the martial arts and his, you know, uh, the knowledge he brings about Jeet Kune Do and Wing Chun and MMA and training. And sometimes you're just like, wow, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, may he rest in peace. But now it's time to get into our episode. And we've decided to uh, go back to kind of one of our more popular formats that people seem to like. And I guess it's what uh, the kids might call a listicle. I mean, that's what they're called to do articles with like top tens. But anyways, we're doing another top 10 uh, list today. And so our list is the top 10 foreign performers in Hong Kong martial arts cinema. So we did have to set some ground rules before though to define kind of what would be a quote unquote foreigner. And obviously, uh, you know, people may agree or disagree, but what one of the main ground rules we set is you cannot obviously be from Hong Kong. <laughs> and because of the unique factor of a lot of these performers in the 80s, so therefore being born in the 60s and 50s, and kind of global politics and what was going on in Southeast Asia at that time, we've also set that you cannot be part of the Chinese diaspora that was born uh, in a, another territory of Southeast Asia at that time. So to explain, uh, for example, someone like Michelle Yeoh, born in Malaysia, you know, she is mm -hmm. Malaysian Chinese, we're not going to allow to count because, you know, she's a Cantonese speaking uh, mm -hmm. Chinese Malay who did her whole career in Hong Kong, right, to consider her like a foreign player or performer, I think would be, you know, slightly inaccurate. I mean, we could have just gone with the term of like guaylo, right? But then that would have been quasi-racist and also limited because then that's, you know, white people performing, right? Uh, yeah. And that's not the only people on our list, obviously. So, uh, for example, some other ones like Michelle Yeoh would be like Ken Lo, who was born mm -hmm. in, I believe, like Laos, right? But, you know, yeah. Cantonese-speaking Chinese uh, individual that moved back to Hong Kong. Uh, we have Bruce Lay, you know, the impersonator uh, who was born <laughs> in Burma, supposedly. Uh, and then like, you know, someone like Flash Legs Tan, who was born in Korea, but then shortly thereafter moved to Taiwan because his parents were mm -hmm. from Shandong, you know, fleeing communist China. Uh, most likely we have uh, Lo Lei, who was born in Indonesia, uh, you know, and then moved back and had his whole career in Hong Kong. Chan Singh, born in Thailand, and then sent back at a young age to be educated in China by his parents. And then, so to clarify also, anyone from the, the Chinese territories or disputed Chinese territories of, you know, mainland China, Taiwan, we're also not including. So for example, someone like Angela Mao from Taiwan, not included. Uh, you know, Jet Li being born in mainland China doesn't, you know, he... He doesn't count. Uh, Donnie Yen was born in mainland China. People forget, you know, he's born, I think in Shunda maybe in Guangdong, doesn't count. Wu Jing, you know, wouldn't count. Uh, Dick Wei wouldn't count, right? So these are just kind of the, the factors. But if you were, for example, an American born Chinese, that would be okay. So for example, someone like Daniel Wu would be okay. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the, did I miss anything there you think? I think you. I think you hit everything. Uh, I now have nobody on my list, though. Ah, <laughs> Just, <laughs> baloney, baloney, Tony. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you hit everything, and it, it's it's uh, when you first sent me the text saying, "Hey, let's do this list." Right off the bat, like five names popped into my head, and they're all in first place. I'm like, "Oh, this list is going to be easy." And then I sat down to start writing the list. I'm like, "This list is not easy at all." Yeah. <laughs> oh, mine's. <laughs> Mine has shifted back and forth more than uh, 
you could possibly imagine. I've had like some people that were close to like the top two and then are didn't even make the list, which is, seems to be yeah. our MO. We always do this because you, you right yeah. out the gate. And, and then there's a lot of factors that go into it. Like, okay, am I basing it just off their performances or what they contributed to Hong Kong cinema? Am I basing it off of how many performances they had or just the significance of say like one performance? And I think that's why it's going to make our lists very different because I know some people on my list, it's more so the iconic roles they had, whereas others, mm -hmm. it's more the body of work, the overall body and what they contributed to Hong Kong cinema. So uh, I think it will be a cool mix. I, I honestly think our lists are going to be very different. I think so too. And I mean, like, you know, before we started recording, I basically said, I love my one through four. Yeah. And I think that there's, I think that there's some spots in there that my other people might argue shouldn't be there. Uh, I love my six and then basically my five, seven, eight, nine, ten are like, should they like be here? What position should they be in? And then, you know, I think I, I probably already mentioned once we started rolling or it was before we started recording. Uh, my honorable mention list is basically a public apology. Like, yeah. I am sorry, you guys are not on this list. You guys are actual working professionals, but they're, they're, I feel justified in the names I've picked. I've left like one master off that if he, if he uh, saw me in the street, I'd have to like grovel for an apology. Of course, that's because he does listen to this podcast as they all do. As they, as they all do. I mean, sure. <laughs> but so in that case, I guess we better get going before I change my mind again, but let's do our I honorable know. mentions. Okay. Okay. So you, oh, you go ahead. I, I've, uh, I, I thought we've done this in the past, like say my number 10 is somebody and it's the same as your number one. We should, we don't discuss them until we get to that person. So you wouldn't tell me, oh, that's my number one, but he's on my list too. Let's wait till we get to him. And then we discuss that person. Right. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. All right. Um, my, I have my honorable mentions <laughs> and then I have my below the line honorable mentions. And it's kind of not cool to do that, but I'm gonna start with my below the line honorable mentions. It's because they don't have enough films uh, under the belt in Hong Kong. And also right. I felt like, so I'm gonna do it. I wanted to say Scott Atkins and Darren Shalavi. Oh, very, you know what? I, I'm gonna add Darren Shalavi to my honorable mentions. Uh, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, but they're just below the line. I mean, but yeah. Darren took out Samo in a film. So what the heck, he's gotta be on that list. Yep. Uh, my other honorable mentions, and I and I, I really this is this is where I start my apology is Jeff Falcone, mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Fontaine, and Mark Houghton, mm -hmm. and Mark Houghton. Houghton. Thank you. And then my major apology goes to uh, uh, Master G Han J. Oh, uh, very yeah. good. You know what? He he didn't make my list, but he definitely should be. Uh, uh, spoiler alert: There's someone very close to him that makes my list. But yeah, okay. Mr. Bihan J is very significant in terms of what he contributed to Hong Kong cinema. So Agreed. it's understandable that if he did make your list, but also understandable that he did it just because his body of work really wasn't that much, right? Hot Keto, yeah. Fist of Unicorn, and Game of Death, really. Yeah. And, and I have two guys who are off to the side who I just felt like kind of were like a throwback to old Hong Kong. And it's the final fight from Who Am I with uh, Ron Smork. Spornberg and Jung Kwan. I felt like they, it was a nice throwback segment, but it was also a little campy and uh, it's an honorable mention. Yeah. Ron Spornberg's been very active in Thailand for like the last decade. And he was yeah. recently in Triple Threat. I, I think I told you that like my first day at work at uh, Martial Law when I was on lunch break, they, or the, the person answering the phone who was on lunch break left the phones are like Gavin can you answer the phones and the one phone call I got was literally from him asking to be on the show ah. and I was like I'm like are you kidding me <laughs> we, I'm, you know I'm a one day day yeah. player PA part-time PA I'm like let me put you on hold we'd love to have you and I'm like I go into the producer you guys got to take this call he was amazing but uh, uh as you know he didn't make and, the show and now he's been wanting to kick your ass for 21 years hey I, I advocated for him yeah <laughs> It's too bad. Okay. Uh, is that all of your honorable mentions? That's my honorable mentions. Right. I'm looking forward to yours. So my honorable mention, my first one, uh, I have to honorably mention our sensei, Peter Sugarfoot Cunningham. And the only reason he didn't make the list is because he only did one Hong Kong movie. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's an iconic role uh, as the assassin 
in Writing Wrongs, aka Above the Law, which he does fantastically. He has a great fight scene with you and you and Bial, but unfortunately, he just he didn't do anything more. He did obviously No Retreat, No Surrender, a co-production. He did a lot more acting, but just you know he didn't do enough to make my list. And with him, and this individual might actually make your list, so don't say anything. Uh, Gary Daniels. Mm -hmm. who once again doesn't make my list simply because he just had his one role right he did Mm -hmm. do uh you know co-production with blood moon and so forth and uh a a bunch of prolific career in the west uh but unfortunately just you know he had his one very iconic role in city hunter almost iconic enough to make the list but just didn't make it for me uh chuck norris is on mm-hmm. my honorable mentions. Obviously, mm-hmm. without Way of the Dragon, we wouldn't have the fight scenes we have today and uh, his oft forgotten role in Slaughter in San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> yes. Tom Wong. So he did do another Hong Kong movie, <laughs> people forget. Uh, I have Brad Allen on my honorable mentions from the Jackie Chan stunt team. The reason he mm-hmm. doesn't make my list is because really he only had one like role per se and gorgeous, and it's a fantastic role, incredible fight sequences but just not enough. Uh, Andy On makes my honorable mention list, the American-born Chinese martial arts actor, current, because uh, I think he's a fantastic performer. He's grown into a fantastic performer. Very interesting. Mistaken. He didn't really have a martial arts background before being cast in Black Mass 2, but uh, I like him as an actor. I like his performances. Sometimes he's slightly over the top, but I enjoy it. Uh, so he's there. I'm almost done here. Uh, Hiroyuki Sonata, aka Henry Sonata, who is in Ninja and the Dragon's Den and Royal Warriors. So those are like his two big Hong Kong roles. Uh, For me, once again, just wasn't enough uh, work in Hong Kong to make the list. Uh, Dragon Lee makes my list as an honorable mention because he had such a prolific career as a Bruce Blatation actor. You gotta love his campiness. You gotta love how much effort he put into his roles. He just didn't have enough or really any idea iconic like okay you don't really throw a dragon lee movie out to someone that's looking to start watching hong kong cinema you know what i mean like dragon on fire is a classic movie and stuff but he doesn't have any of those like poster worthy on your wall movie roles uh and my last one and he was on my list and then off and on then off and on uh is casanova wong oh that's yeah i i totally yeah, and here's the reason why. So Casanova Wong totally deserves to be on the list, but he had a prolific career in both Korea and Hong Kong and co-productions mm-hmm. and so forth. He did star in literally what I, is sometimes my favorite kung, movie, kung fu movie of all time, Warriors 2, yep. uh, and Game of Death 2, which is a, you know, that fight scene we've talked about before is very significant. I mean, Story of Drunken Master and a few other roles, but he just, aside from Warriors 2, he didn't really have any classic you know, films that really stood out for me enough to be on this list, right? You know, Warriors 2, I will recommend to anybody interested in starting Kung Fu movies, but it was, you know, that's why he just fell off my list at the last second. No, I, I, I understand that completely. Uh, I, I, I didn't even, uh, you know what, I, I didn't even think of him as, he was so, his roles were so embedded that I didn't even, I forgot or did not think of him or did not give him the respect as being a foreign born performer right. coming to Hong Kong. Yeah. And that's the, a oh, really, that's a really, that's a really great list. And, and I, 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 I think I should have mentioned where everybody was from, obviously. Uh, Peter Sugarfoot Cunningham is from Canada. Gary Daniels from the UK. Uh, Chuck Norris, America. Brad Allen, Australia. Andy on I mentioned was American born Chinese. Haruyuki Sonata is from Japan. Dragon Lee, Korea and Casanova Wong, Korea. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I like your I like your honorable mention list. I think that what what you and I did is you may have picked the working professionals. I'm I'm really looking forward to this top ten list because oh, you yeah. may have put some of the working professionals that were on my honorable mention, and I some of your honorable mentions definitely make my list. Steve, and I'm excited to find. I think we're both going to have this people that we forgot because I know there's always going to be someone you forget. <laughs> like how the I heck did I forget them? Oh my! And then you feel guilty, right? Then it's like yeah. if you saw them in the street, you would bow. You know, yes. I'm not worthy. Yes. But let's get going. Number ten. Okay. So you number 10, I, okay, I actually have a tie of two of your honorable mentions, and if that's cheating, too bad. No, uh, it's funny. Real quick, my number 10 is multiple <laughs> people as well, so we both okay. cheated on number 10. Okay. So go ahead and go. Uh, Gary Daniels and, uh, and Sensei Petey. There I you have go. them both so you on know there. What? That, that's fair enough, and God, I wanted to put both of them on there so bad just because Gary Daniels was such a huge influence for me as a kid. Yes. Uh, as And I, uh, you know, Sugarfoot, obviously, uh, but yes, go ahead. 
So, I mean, so for, for Gary Daniels, when I was going through the list, I actually had forgotten about him. Uh, and then I'm like, wait a minute, I have an entry point. And it's one of my favorite fight scenes. Now, I'm, I'm biased because I, I had the opportunity to see City Hunter on the big screen. And I'm not talking about his street fighter fight scene with Jackie Chan. No. I'm definitely talking about the bedroom fight scene. Yes. I think that's fantastic. It's one of the best crispest fight scenes out there. And even the part where in uh, uh, Richard Norton Bustin with the gun playing Ronald or McDonald or Donald yeah. McRonald. Or McDonald, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. So when he comes in and points the gun and then they start like avoiding hits from each other, even that segment is, uh, it just shows what Gary Daniels could have done had he been in Hong Kong uh, for a larger portion of his career. I just thought that fight scene is fantastic. It's iconic to me and very few uh, foreign actors looked as cool and shared as much screen presence and charisma as Jackie Chan. And it was just great to see them. And then what I loved is the story brought them back to have a second fight together. Two things real quick about that. Obviously one, I agree with you. It's like, why didn't he do more? But when you look at when uh, City Hunter came out, it was 1993. That was towards the tail end of kind of like the golden era of Hong Kong cinema production starting to dwindle, especially for foreign participants, because they were already anticipating the handover back to mainland China and contemporary pictures were almost becoming less and less aside from these big giant ones, right? And the uh, kind of more classical period set ones were becoming more popular. So therefore those had less roles for foreigners unless you were playing, you know, like uh, the foreign diplomat and so forth. So, and a lot of the stunt players from that era talk about that in interviews. So I kind of, I just wish he could have jumped on a couple years before and had a few yeah. more goals, but also that fight scene. Cause I knew exactly that was the one you were talking about. It's his kickboxing in that sequence oh. is just, yeah. it's crisp. It's on point. His kicks are so fast. His punches are so good. And just the rhythm with Jackie is so good. And at some, at one point, and maybe this could have just been cause it was his first time doing a Hong Kong fight scene. And maybe he couldn't get the rhythm and movement right hundred percent. He's planted on like one leg and just bah, yes. bah, 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 and it's just so good. And uh, also got to say, uh, what, what would be the appropriate way to say this? The whole training sequence beforehand, it was very inspirational and no homo. Okay. I'm just gonna say no homo. He's yeah. ripped, he's doing the splits, he's working out, yeah. he's all greased up, but it's like, holy crap. Gary Daniels has one of the best, you know, movie physiques of all time. Absolutely. Uh, it, it just goes to his, uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? How dedicated he was to his training, right? And yeah. to this day, he's in phenomenal shape on Facebook. It's like, holy crap, man. You know, I, I, I'm, I'll never be as flexible as you, but I'm going to keep working hard. So, uh, excellent. Now we'll talk about, uh, PD. Yeah. So PD. So for me, uh, the reason why I left some of the working professionals off the list and added PD to the list is I just, I hate to say it this way, but I love the authenticity that PD brought to the screen against Yoon Biao. Uh, part of that, he had the advantage of Corey Yoon and yeah. Yoon Biao and great editing, uh, great camera angles and just it was so tight and I also appreciate the fact that if I'm not mistaken PD was between fights at that time so he came in in yep. fighter shape and there's one kick that he just launches and it's it's like right up to uh Yoon Bial's head it just uh I, I don't know I I couldn't leave him off the list if Gary Daniels is on the list PD's on the list and they're they're showing that same spot and I think you did a great job by doing that and I'm jealous I didn't think of that but yes, he was in between fights because when he did one fight, came over and he hadn't told them that he had to go back to <laughs> Reno and fight. And so he's there and he's all nervous. And then he decided to tell him like, uh, I got to go back and fight in a few weeks. And they're like, okay, yeah, no problem. Then just come back. It's like, oh, okay. And that's what he did. <laughs> and the thing is, the other unique thing about that fight is you get to see his kickboxing movement for sure. But there's also a whole sequence where he's doing very straightforward, like karate style. So it just showed yes. the diversity in sensei's techniques that he could do. You know, it's like, all right, yeah, I can do karate if you want. Okay, I can do, you know, kickboxing if you want. So, uh, you know, he's just a phenomenal performer, uh, both in the ring and in cinema. Because yeah. it's like he's, he's famously told us the story of where Sensei Benny one day in the Jet Center where, you know, he was trained for one of his fights and he's just, you know, having a hard time. 
and you know, Sensei Benny told him, you're not a fighter and everyone laughs and Sugarfoot's like, what? And then, you know, he pulls him aside and says, you're a performer. And, you know, if anybody knows Sensei Benny or spent time with Sensei Benny, you get it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then sure enough, what he meant was, you know, Sugarfoot is just a whole nother level. You know, he yeah. goes in the ring and performs. He goes in the ring and it's like fight of the night every time. Yeah. So I, I yeah, so I, I, you understand completely why I threw those two guys on there. Oh, yeah. Again, more, if they had more fights, they definitely probably would have been on both of our lists and higher up. Yep. Because what they, what they, the glimpse that they gave us, for me, both those scenes are memorable. Both those scenes are in movies that are almost pitch perfect. I, I think Above the Law is a perfect film. City Hunter has some flaws, but it's got some fun sequences. Oh, yeah. I love City Hunter. Uh, no shame. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, All right, you you're, you're 10. Yes. My number 10. So we both kind of cheated on this one, but I just had to. My number 10 is the ever revolving door of late 80s and early 90s foreign stunt people. So this includes <laughs> Mark Houghton, who you mentioned. Okay. This includes, yeah. I have it all written down here. So I'm not just making this up. I wrote down Mark Houghton, Bruce Fontaine, uh, Jeff Falcon, John Salviti, and Michael Woods. Thank you. Uh, Vincent Lynn and uh, Sophia Crawford. Very nice, very nice list. Yeah, I, I had, yeah, that, that they're went part even of this beyond the, the later era of like the late '80s, early '90s. And you can actually, if you've ever listened to an interview with Bruce Fontaine or uh, Sophia Crawford, they both talk about this same sort of thing that in the early '90s, kind of, uh, you know, we're talking '91, '92, the roles for foreigners were like diminishing, right? Because, mm -hmm. as I said, this uh, anticipated handover. So a lot of the production, whereas in the 80s, there were so many movies being made by so many different companies. In the 90s, uh, these low budget ones or even medium budget ones kind of fell to the wayside. They were no more. It was only like the big budget ones. And obviously, the Once Upon a Time in China series was huge. Like these period set ones that didn't really have many roles for foreigners, let alone stunt foreigners. So a yep. lot of the production moved to the Philippines. Uh, and, you know... Sophia Crawford pretty much talks about turning down the chance to do that. You know, she'd been in Hong Kong for like four or five years. Uh, Bruce Fontaine talks about that. And it's like, you know, they had to take other jobs. That's why Bruce Fontaine missed out on doing super cop. Uh, I know. Another job. I know. Uh, Mark Houghton seemed to keep working pretty regularly because he switched over to TV, if I'm not mistaken, a lot. And obviously he was an apprentice uh, of his Sifu Lao Galong. So, you know, he had, I feel maybe more connections in that sense. Uh, Jeff Falcon, no one really knows what happened to him. <laughs> uh, and John Salviti and Michael Woods, you know, obviously they did the Donnie movies, uh, Tiger Cage, Tiger Cage 2 mm -hmm. and The Lion Duty 4, uh, Crystal Hunt. Uh, and uh, what other ones? Did? Michael Woods came back for uh, Ballistic Kiss, uh, which was a little bit later. But these, these are the guys, like sometimes when you say like the foreign stunt people of Hong Kong cinema, these are the ones I think of. This is the era I think of, of all these performers. And obviously some of them made your honorable mentions list, but I think of these kind of before some of the other people that are going to make uh, our list. Did I get cut off there? Uh, you, it, there was a glip, oh, like okay. a blip. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, but these, I think of these people first almost, you know, and they, they never had starring roles. Obviously there was never a buddy uh, cop film starring Bruce Fontaine and Vincent Lynn, even though I would have loved to see that. But, yes. You know, they, they had iconic bad guy roles, as I already mentioned, John Salvini and Michael Woods and all the Donnie Yen ones. I mean, we had Vincent Lin and Jeff Falcone in uh, Lady Reporter, right? Um, Outlaw, yeah. Outlaw Brothers. Outlaw Brothers, exactly. Mark Houghton, you know, is just mm -hmm. in everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Skinny Tiger, Fatty Dragon, his part in that. So I feel like this isn't really cheating. I just feel like these, these guys deserve to be on there. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, 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 I see them as true professionals yeah. and, you know, they, it wasn't in a time they, they didn't necessarily receive a lot of glory, but these guys stayed in shape, studied and found a way to become, to work regularly in a, in, in an environment where maybe they didn't have to. Like, yeah. you know, if they didn't put in the work, you know, no one would have thought any less of them. But these guys were working professionals. So this, these, are, these are people that definitely need to be on this list. And I love how expansive your, your, how, how yeah. you included more than just the three guys. 
And a, a lot of these guys have continued to work. Some of them came back to the U.S. and worked and stuff. Uh, Bruce Fontaine directed a film a couple years back that was on Netflix forever. They, they recently took it off, but I believe it's on Tubi maybe or Prime. It's called Beyond Redemption. And mm -hmm. uh, the there isn't a ton of fight scenes in it because they made it on such a low budget, but the ones they have are fantastic. The finale is fantastic. Somebody's got to give this guy a chance to direct something uh, else because uh, I think he's, he's got the talent. And these people were behind the camera with some of the greats, right? You know, they were working yeah. with Jackie Chan, uh, Sammo, all these guys. And so I think they know they have the eye to shoot action. So uh, if any rich people are listening to our podcast, Outside first, of the two of us. Outside yeah. of the two of us, yeah. First, uh, give us some money to do this regularly and uh, be our full-time job. Second, please give one of these people a chance to make a movie. Uh, I think Bruce Fontaine. Mark Houghton is now back into trying to get movies made in Hong Kong. Uh, I know John Salvini has like a stunt team in Southern California. Really, I mean, you, you can't go wrong with these individuals. But I digress. Let's move on to number nine. Number nine uh, on your honorable mention list, Brad Allen. Ooh, very good. And I'd imagine it's it's mostly because of his role in Gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, it's it's one of these actors who's only in, uh, well, not only in one film. He's in a few films. Right. But uh, iconically or standout wise, uh, he's in one film, but he's got two separate fights. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, much like my the honorable mentions I, from Who Am I, this, fi this fight is, is a throwback fight. Uh, I think it's one of the iconic fights. Uh, it, it stands out from that era, which I believe was the late 90s, correct? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah late 90s. 99. Yeah, so it, it stands out. It's a great way to close off the, the decade and the century. And, uh, even, and, and it also captures almost what Jackie Chan was about, which is there's growth in the films. The character allowed, there's, there's acting, I don't know. Basically, I love this fight scene. It's one of the fight scenes that if I have to pull up just one scene, that might be the one scene that I, you know, I might pull up the pedicab fight scene with uh, Samuel and Bruce, uh, Billy Chow, or I might pull up this fight scene. Depends on what mood I'm in, but I couldn't leave him off the list and uh, my number nine. And fair enough too, because uh, especially the second fight, the, the finale of Gorgeous, that could be on a list. It depends on, once again, the parameters you set of one of the greatest like ring fights, even though they're not in a ring, but they have yeah. the gloves on and it's treated like a kickboxing match, right? And it's just, and that whole movie is so underrated. And I know it's nostalgia because uh, I still remember when that came out, it got a release here at the same time. It was at yeah. Hollywood Video Blockbuster. For those who don't remember, when a new movie would come out at Hollywood Video, especially, it would have like its own wall. You know, there'd be like 20 <laughs> copies of it on the wall. Uh, and then obviously the VHS tape wouldn't be with it. You know, you'd have to bring it to the front then go in the back and get you one. But so I remember getting to see it when it first came out and just loving it. Even I was only 12. And even though it was like a romance film, it, it kind of deconstructed the whole martial arts genre by doing that. And Jackie had always wanted to do a film like that, but had kind of promised his man, longtime manager, Willie Chan, that he wouldn't do like romance or anything. A lot of it is they were afraid of excluding uh, a lot of his Japanese fan base, which was female. And mm -hmm. by doing a romantic role, they were always kind of afraid it, it, it might not play out well enough. And I, I know there's, there's horror stories about female fans in Japan uh, and their obsession with Jackie Chan, but I, I just love that film. I love the fight scenes, both of them in that, but especially the finale. So I think it is an extremely worthy entry. I'm looking for, forward to your number nine. Okay, my number nine. And this is not, uh, it's just, it's kind of the universe, just the way it works, right? Because when I first mentioned this to you last week, this topic, he was already on my list. And actually, he's moved down a lot. He was higher up, but now he's number nine. But that is the Black Dragon, Ron Van Cleef. And that's why uh, it was such a coincidence that that thing yeah. came up yesterday. I literally saw it, I think, 15 minutes before it started. And I was like, huh. And I figured I'd already missed it. You know, sometimes when you see a post and there's like, oh, two days ago. I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'll jump on this. You know, I was going to go for an afternoon walk. Uh, and then, yeah, so... 
I already had, it's not just, well, he was so cool and nice to me yesterday. I'm going to throw him on the list. He's already on my list. And in fact, he's actually moved down a little bit, but Ron Van Cleef, and I will make my argument for this right now. He is the pioneer of a foreigner performing in Hong Kong cinema, especially on his own accord. You know, Mm -hmm. before this, obviously Golden Harvest had been bringing in a lot of the Korean uh, specialists. Uh, Bruce Lee at Golden Harvest had brought in, you know, some of his friends, Chuck Norris, so forth, so forth. But, you know, Ron Van Cleef kind of made it over there on his own, in a sense. Uh, And he really is the first foreigner to headline a film in Hong Kong, the Black Dragon series. Now, a lot of his films were actually more profitable in the States, but uh, he, he kind of pioneered it. He, this, we're talking 1974, I think, was the first Black Dragon movie where he's a co-star with Jason Pai Piao. And then, you know, his first, the real starring role was the Black Dragon's Revenge, right? And then the next one, Wave the Black Dragon. The ones after that were kind of the same thing. He'd be an ensemble cast or, you know, one of three main players. But, you know, he would get on the poster, uh, even for the ones that he initially wasn't. So Black Dragon, you know, he's all up on the poster. I remember finally getting a copy of Black Dragon as a kid and being so disappointed he wasn't in it more. But then it was Black Dragon's Revenge is his starring one, which in my opinion... Mm -hmm is an extremely underrated Kung Fu film, still stands the test of time with the fight scenes and the choreography, which he was highly responsible for. Uh, and uh, it had very innovative choreography because he had a huge hand in it. Like he went over there and, you know, he talks about in interviews and stuff, how the stuntmen just assumed he couldn't do anything. And it's like, no, 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 sit back, son. L- hold my beer. Let me show you how it's done. And, you know, he just blew their minds with what he was able to do. And the best part is it's one of the few, uh, Hong Kong films where the dubbing was done by the star. So Ron Van Cleef did his own dubbing for the oh, English. Really? So it's his I, voice. Yeah. And that's, that's the, one of the best parts. Like, uh, you know, there's the whole sequence uh, with uh, the kind of the mention of, and Tiger and I were talking about this after the interview yesterday with the whole like kind of uh, blackface thing done in Hong Kong cinema. And so he goes backstage at a Chinese opera performance and there's a female performer that has, uh, you know, uh, black face paint. And she says, oh, special Chinese makeup. And then she looks at him and like, is like, and you? He says, nah, that's the real shit, baby. And it's just, it's so great because it's his actual voice, right? Uh, So yeah, I mean, he paved the way, right? He was over in Hong Kong, doing things before anybody else did. Not to mention he, in the early eighties, he was also doing full contact uh, kind of not, not underground, but just weird mixed rules fighting. You can watch him on YouTube. It's not just speculation. It's, you know, he was, he's a martial artist at heart. He's a fantastic performer and he kind of did something before anybody else. And he's often forgotten about for that. And I just feel that's why he deserved to be on this list. And simply because wave the black dragon is one of my favorite Kung Fu movies. So Mr. Ron Van Cleef is my number nine. Excellent choice. And, and like you said, uh, as we go into this list, we're going to come across people we, we forgot about or didn't think to put on this list. And I, I'm totally guilty of that. Great no choice. Worries. And, and obviously, make me- uh, just to uh, backtrack a second, Ron Van Cleef is American. Uh, your number nine, Brad oh, Allen, is my, uh, Australian. Yes. Um, so now we're... We're at my number eight. Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the person I thought you were texting me about. Now I realize you were texting me about somebody else, but uh, Brandon Lee. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This came out of nowhere. Uh, um, interesting. So it's okay. Let's hear obviously, obviously it's a starring role, Legacy yeah. of Rage. Yeah. Um, so to come right off the bat and be in a starring role as a as a foreign born performer, obviously he had not, not a backdoor into the uh, into the world of cinema, but you know his, his father obviously paved the way for the whole genre. But Who he comes in as a. Uh, I think it was uh, Dragon Lee. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, that's yeah. right. That, yeah. You sure? <laughs> oh yeah. Anyways. Uh, uh, no, he, he he has a starring. He comes in as a starring role, and he his charisma carries the film. And I know this is not this is I know this is about martial arts. Uh, these are martial art films, but we were talking about best performer, and 
sometimes you have performers who great martial arts and the acting, the charisma doesn't match or vice versa. You have great charisma, but there's no martial arts there. So you kind of like hide their skills. So his charisma is carrying the film, in my opinion. And then, you know, his fights, his fight sequences are come through for me. They, they, it's really great to see him face off with Bolo Young. I think it's, I think Bolo Young is, uh, um, I don't know. He, he sort of brings like the, the past with him and it's a stamp of approval on a performer if they're in a Hong Kong film and if they can defeat him, defeat him. I think he, he's very generous in a way to let, uh, Jean-Claude Van Tam defeat him twice and also let Brandon Lee defeat him. He, he basically is that uh, character. I don't know if you saw Once Upon a Time in the West, but they were yeah. talking to the, so yeah, the, we're talking to Leonardo DiCaprio saying, you know, your role now is to, you're using your history and your role now is to uh, establish new stars. And that's what Wait, Bolo Young. Once Upon a uh, Time in Hollywood? Oh yeah, did I say West? I said Hollywood. I meant yeah, Hollywood. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. Yeah, I mentioned the better film. Sorry. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> yeah. So basically, Bolo Young um, sells really well for Brandon Lee, and not that anyone needs to sell for Brandon Lee because we know his U.S. output as well. But right. from 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 a star making role, this he delivers, and I I I. I I just buy the scenes. I rewatch just to double check to make sure am I am I just like not like building up because he is Bruce Lee's son and because I really wanted to see him successful in a Hong Kong film, and I feel that I was able to divorce that feeling and just watch him for his performance and for his fights. And he and while his fights aren't like Jackie Chan movement, his fights are there's a lot of power in his hits, and I I just bought it as a realistic film. And the thing you have to remember at that point when he did that movie because that was like his first big role. He hadn't trained in the martial arts since he was a kid with his dad. And he, it's not like he went through extensive training like for movies in Hong Kong, like sometimes they make stars do. I'm sure he, in fact, if anything, I've heard in interviews, it's like he was partying, he was young, you know. He, he didn't like train for this role either. So that says something that he just naturally had that charisma and ability when delivering the moves. Because uh, I do, I love that fight scene with Bolo in the alleyway, but he does look a little more stiff, right? It yeah. wouldn't be until a couple of years later where he kind of embraced the action role that uh, the, excuse me, the action star role that he never really wanted, that he went back to the Inasano Academy and started training hardcore. And that's why in films, uh, pretty much, you know, Showdown Little Tokyo, Rapid Fire, and then The Crow, you see a whole nother level of authenticity in his performance. But yeah, uh, so that just goes to show, I mean, how natural he was and how he definitely was his father's son. His father it, being Lee Van Cleef. Yes, <laughs> it's it's basically it's basically like watching uh, it's it's like watching a rookie, and you know you're watching something special. Yeah. And then when you're watching those other films, it's like, oh, now he's the world champion. He, he just, but everything that he delivered in his later films, and the promise that he could have delivered more, were all present in Legacy of Rage, and so I, I couldn't leave him off the list. Excellent entry. Excellent entry. Uh, okay, my number eight, uh, and you may have this person, you may not, so if you do, let me know and we'll wait to talk. Uh, my number eight is Wong Ying Sik. Wong, yes, I do have this person. And he was, he was floating between the number he's at and the number you just mentioned. Okay, so uh, we'll wait until uh, we get to your uh, entry for Wong Ying Sik. So in that case, number seven. Okay. In that case, my number seven is uh, uh, Chuck Norris. Oh, so he made <laughs> your list. Oh, very nice, very nice. Okay, let's uh, let's hear it. I, I mean, we we've talked about this fight sequence before with he and uh, he and Bruce Lee, and I mean, it's, it is one of the most iconic. I think it was in both of our top three or top four. I think it was your number one, wasn't it, or was it uh, your number two? I, it came out to my number two. I gave Donnie, and it, uh, yeah, number one. Yeah, and it was, it was like my number three, I think. Right. Yeah, we both agreed on Donnie Yen, and then I had Samo, yeah, so, or Jackie, and anyway. Uh, yeah, so I, for someone who is 50% of that fight sequence or 40% of that fight sequence, uh, and it is one of the most iconic fight sequences, I couldn't see him not on this list. I did 
I think at the beginning I told you I'm like I had a, like a lot of questions about this set area of my list, and I thought about putting them on the honorable mention because it is just that fight sequence, but so much came from there. And he, you know, on screen, this is probably I kind of prefer Chuck Norris when he does play like a slightly bad character. I yeah. think one of his, I think some of his great films are either when he's really angry or when he's bad or undercover cop uh, doing bad. So basically his well, acting changes a little bit and he has, he has a good presence and he's, he got, he got big for this role. Yeah. Slight anti-hero personalities suit him well. Uh, I mean, yeah. his greatest film, Lone Wolf McQuaid, you know, Lone Wolf McQuaid is a, uh, I mean, depending on your definition, some people would argue he's not an anti-hero. I think uh, people get a little too nitpicky, but yes, that role is kind of a anti-hero role and it's his favorite yeah. role of mine. Yeah, I, so for for me, if, since we're on the topic of favorite role of Chuck Norris, it's it's Hitman for me. Right. So, uh, but yeah, he he's he basically he's he's he is literally the heavy. He put on some weight for this role. He got bigger for this role, and you know the the movement uh, is the movement that both he and Bruce Lee uh, put on screen in this film is something we haven't seen, we hadn't seen before, and you know. There are some sequences that are like that, but they don't necessarily have the heart that this scene had. Yeah. So. Uh, no, I I hundred percent agree with this entry as well. Uh, yes, he only did two Hong Kong movies per se, but you know the fact of the matter is he did one of the most iconic, greatest roles of all time. So that automatically gets you on the list. So uh, fantastic entry. Can't argue with that. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we're up to your seven. My number seven is Miss Yukari Oshima. Okay. Is she I think we're gonna be, yeah, we're going to be talking about the, uh, our two overlaps very soon. Oh, okay. So then, if, uh, <laughs> damn it. So, okay, your turn again. Well, who's your number so, six? Uh, my number six is Huang Ying Shik. Shik. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, so there we go. We're now yeah. Huang Ying Shik. Okay. So for me, it's funny. When I first saw this list, I didn't even think of putting Huang Ying Shik on there. Uh, you know, he always pops up in my head. But then the more I thought about it, I realized, first of all, he has plenty of Hong Kong movies. You know, some people are going to instantly only think his two roles in uh, his most iconic ones, Way of the Dragon and then Young Master. Uh, but obviously there's Way of the Dragon, Fist of Unicorn, Hapkido, When Taekwondo Strikes, The Young Master, Dragon Lord. Mm -hmm. And so of his three like biggest, or excuse me, his two biggest roles would really be The Young Master and Dragon Lord. And both those fight scenes are phenomenal. Uh, I believe, or Young Master is always on the top 10 of Japanese fight scenes. Dragon Lord may also be at like number 10. I forget when he did his first biography, like what he made as his list. But so, and obviously his role in Way of the Dragon, like Chuck Norris, smaller, but very iconic. Who does karate better than the Japanese? Uh, even though obviously he's Korean. But uh, uh, <laughs> I digress. Anyways. He's also so significant because he was one of the main actors with Ji Hong Jae to help train those Golden Harvest actors that they brought over to Korea in the early 70s, including Angela Mao, Sammo Hung, Jackie Chan in yep. Hapkido. And so the kicking techniques of Hapkido are really responsible for that involvement of kicks in Hong Kong cinema, which would eventually become the kickboxing style. But they had a lot of influence from Hapkido that they directly learned under Ji Hong Jae and Wang and Sik. And just from my own comparison of the two, I'd imagine most of the kicking probably came from him. Ji Hong Jae was much more of the joint manipulation, uh, you know, like Aiki Jiu Jitsu in Japanese or Chi Na in Chinese. Uh, but so you can see the, the impact he had and why it's so important. And he had, I, I love his roles actually in Hapkido and when Taekwondo strikes because they're back to back, very similar movies, like the same cast. But in Hapkido, he plays a good guy. You get to see him come at the end and help kick ass. And then when Taekwondo strikes, he plays a bad guy. Uh, he plays, you know, uh, a Japanese antagonist. Whereas in Hapkido, he plays a Korean protagonist. And you really get to see his kicking on display. And one of the things I love about the young master is he actually doesn't get to do uh, a whole lot of his kicking. It's all the joint manipulation. And yeah. really, I don't think there's ever been a fight that does it better than that almost. Obviously, Steven Seagal in his earlier roles did some fantastic Aikido, but 
you know, the, there's the one sequence where he breaks out of prison in The Young Master where you get to see him do all his kicks. And it's just a reminder of, holy crap, this guy's a phenomenal kicker. I just wish he could have even kicked more in the finale. He does, and it's beautiful. But he his contributions are undeniable. He has at least what would be considered three iconic roles. And he just is on my number number eight on my list. Yeah, and, and uh, so for me... Uh one of the first films I rented from the video store after I kind of got, got to know uh, Jackie Chan was Dragon Lord. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, his, his fight sequence in that film, I think gets overshadowed by his other work, but he is just, you know, the way he pulverizes Mars yes. and, you know, and then, and then that fight sequence between he and he and Jackie Chan in, in confined spaces. And he's, I think in that movie, he plays like, a half blind master, right? Half blind master crook. Doesn't he have, he has, like he has, that. yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I just remember thinking, this guy is so cool. This is what I want to be like when my hair turns gray. You know? You're, <laughs> because you're he, actually the one that had me go back and rewatch that because as a kid, I saw Dragon Lord. And the reason why I wasn't that into it at the time is there's not a whole lot of like martial arts action as I would like or as clean. And even the finale, remember Jackie Chan's not like the stellar martial artist. And for me as a kid, I think that was kind of the form of escapism I connected with was wanting to be like a martial arts hero. So yeah. I think he was almost too much, but he was always an every man that you could still connect with on that level. In this one, he was too much of an every man, everyday man, you know? And I think I, I just kind of was like, oh, it's all right. But rewatching it as an adult, when you told me to go back and rewatch it, it's just brutal. It's so, it's so athletic. It's a very yeah. athletic movie. You know, the whole uh, football sequence. Uh, yeah the you know that ending fight it's just hard-hitting stunt work and that the, the stuff they do in that fight obviously contributed to the later hong kong cinema fight scenes where the stunts and the fights kind of came together and there was a lot of brutal hard-hitting action yeah it's 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 funny for me i, I consider the young master the basically uh i the kitchen sink movie jackie chan threw in everything mm-hmm. and it's like if i can't make it with this i'm not gonna make it and then Dragon Lord is, I've made it. So now I'm going to do these set pieces that really have nothing to do with fight sequences. I'm going to create two new sports and we're going to just, uh, I don't know if maybe those are actual sports, but uh, yeah. just, it, they seem like two brand new sports. I was into all the games that they were playing and then and then it ends with that like brutal, brutal fight sequence. But I, f- I feel like those two movies kind of like, you understand that this is Jai Chan, not desperate, but this is what I can do. This is everything. And then, thank you. I'm thank you for your support. Now I'm going to make my vision of uh, of of like something that doesn't have to be married to martial arts the whole way through. Awesome. And as you know, I had just put up my Young Master poster that I've had for like seven years. Uh, the frame fell down and cracked and shattered on that one, and uh, Wheels on Meals. So I oh, had, no. they were super heavy. Like I knew it was going to happen, and like an idiot, I was like, oh, I'm just going to put them up. <laughs> but uh, so I do have a young master poster over there. Uh, love that movie. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, any final thoughts on Wong and Sick? I uh, just, I think his, his impact is beyond the scenes that we've seen, and, and you point out exactly why. Yep. Cool. Um, are, we, are we with you right now, or are we uh, to my next so, one? Wong and Sick was your number six, right? Was my number six or seven? Six. It's yeah. my six. So now, now we're at your six. My six. This is the one I was asking about earlier. And I did as much research as I could. And I can't find any concrete evidence that this individual is of, you know, Chinese nationality or heritage. And even if he was, he's different than all the other ones because he was born and raised in this country, speaking the language, and then went over to do movies in Hong Kong in a sense. So either which way, and I can't find any proof, but... Billy Chong, Chong, aka yes. Billy goes in from Indonesia. Very, I, I overlooked completely. Yep, yep. and I, I, most people do. And the thing is, I, and I honestly, I didn't get into Billy Chong until I moved back to America about, you know, oh my God, almost five years ago now, uh, through Amazon Prime and stuff. I had never had access to his movies as a kid. I never, you know, I'd heard of Kung Fu uh, versus Zombies or Kung Fu Zombies. But mm-hmm. I got into his movies and just, he's a, he's phenomenal. And then, so I, you know, looking into his background, obviously, uh, you know, 
he was his background was Kyokushin Karate and some Kung Fu in the little bit of mm -hmm. interviews you watch with him. But you can see the his kicks are just phenomenal. Like they're beautiful. He could have made our top yeah. kickers list. And now, now re-watching, preparing for this, I was like, you know what? Maybe he should have. You know, just power, precision, flexibility, insane flexibility. But he was also able to perform what was popular at that time, like the comedic uh, Hong Kong style. And, yep. you know, which he did in, for example, like Crystal Fist, which is kind of like his Jackie Chan-esque movie where uh, Simon Yuan is his master. But, uh -huh. you know, I love Kung Fu Executioner, which, uh, did you go with That's... me to watch that at uh, New Beverly? Where Carl- I think Scott so. Came? Yes, because Carl Scott yeah. was there, remember his black yeah. postcard? And we were both looking at when Carl Scott said some of the stuff we did, he did, we're like, <laughs> all right, homie. Uh, but <laughs> either which way, so Kung Fu Executioner, Sun Dragon, Crystal Fist, uh, he, he just, you know, he, and that's another unique thing about him. You didn't see him and think, oh, it's a foreign guy, you know, in a movie, right? And it's like, no, he just was so good as a performer. He, you know, he had his, you know, five, maybe it was like 10 movies total he did. I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure off the top of my head, but some incredible fight sequences. He was so athletic. He could do like gymnastics, kicking, more the traditional Kung Fu style. He has an extremely iconic role for a lot of people, which is uh, Kung Fu versus zombies or Kung Fu zombies or one of the numerous uh, names it's known under. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to see real quick, like what, you know, cause a lot of these movies have alternate titles, right? Yeah, so Kung Fu zombie. Uh, Crystal Fist is also known as Jade Claw. Sun Dragon is also known as A Hard Way to Die, which I believe is mm -hmm. actually the version I've watched. Uh, so I just think uh, he's an often forgotten one. He's a great performer, yeah. super athletic. You know, uh, yeah, there's not much more else to say. Just he is just a very good performer. Billy Chong. Really great show. That, uh, again, um, you've out researched anything I would have even you you like went beyond that that's really a great great choice great research well also I just feel like he's an underappreciated star as it is yeah. by myself included I didn't even know who he was until you know uh not too long ago but you know he went and was doing pictures for Ng Si Yun's uh company uh, uh which one was it at that time uh I forget oh my gosh I wrote down I was doing some research earlier so once again, it wasn't one of the major uh, production companies, obviously it wasn't Golden Harvest, it wasn't Shaw Brothers, but he could have easily been performing uh, in those movies, you know? Yeah. He, I feel like he never really got a fair shake. He was doing more lower budget films, but yeah, yep, he's my number six. So now- Great, great choice. Your number five. My number five is Yuki, uh, Yuki, <laughs> Yukari Oshima. And just so, in case people don't know, Gavin's actually the one that speaks Japanese. So, yeah. uh, shame on you. I'm just kidding. Yes, Yukari Oshima, my number seven, your number five. So, all right, um, so let's go to number, no, I'm kidding. Yes. <laughs> and forget her. But no, I mean, it's, once again, she's, she's one of those ones that is some, like, sometimes they don't need so much explanation, but first of all, uh, very talented martial artist from Japan. However, doing some mm -hmm. research today, I, I read supposedly her mother might have been of Chinese ethnicity. Oh. But I don't know. Uh, but definitely, uh, father's Japanese, born in Japan. Uh, she started studying Gojo Ryu with, uh, in one interview I've watched it there, she uh, calls her sensei a Mr. Mickey. So uh, that's from Top Fighter 2, uh, the documentary. And from what I've read, she was actually maybe a top competitor in Gojo Ru. I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, point sparring style or whatever, but then she came over to Hong Kong and started doing movies and started with smaller roles, like a lot of the foreign players, but then also headlined uh, her own films, you know, yeah. uh, sometimes as like the main antagonist, which uh, I mean, you know, Kickboxer's Tears, she's the main antagonist. Uh, uh, Angels, the first Iron Angels movie, she's, you know, the antagonist. Uh, then she was also the star of Outlaw Brothers, which is a very underrated uh, Hong Kong classic that we had mentioned a little bit before, you know, where she plays the lead. Uh, in the early 90s, she actually kind of went over to the Philippines as these, once again, we mentioned before, the movies mm -hmm. kind of 
becoming more and more uh, limited for the roles for foreigners. And so she went over to the Philippines and she actually invited uh, Sophia Crawford with her. Oh, she and, did. Because they did a bunch of movies together. Yeah. And then Sophia turned it down. She didn't really want to be shooting these super low budget ones over there. But then Yukari Yoshima changed her screen name over there to Cynthia Luster. Yeah, I'm assuming just because it'd be easier for the Filipino market. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, lots of, you know, I kind of obviously she was in Millionaire's Express, uh, one of our favorite movies. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's in a ton. Like if you look at the list, I mean, Ricky O, uh, The Avenging Quartet. I've got her thing up here because there's no way I can memorize all like 100 of these movies. But yeah, we mentioned pretty much the the big main ones. Oh, A Book of Heroes. I almost forgot about Book of Heroes, one of her most iconic roles in epic uh, martial arts films. So yeah, her, I mean, her power is legit. You know, her karate is phenomenal. I think, you know, maybe her her boxing, you know, like wasn't necessarily the, the crispest. It was a much more of those karate hands, but I'm just being nitpicky. Uh, what would you have to say about Yukari Oshima? Well, the, the only few things I would add on to what you've said is uh, essentially she she has that screen presence and she has that uh, she has iconic moments in film. Oh, yeah. And she knows how to capture that. She knows where to she knows where to go fast, where to go powerful. Obviously, you know, the stuff is choreographed and she's working with the choreographers, but she also knows when to take those moments. And I mean. A real simple moment is that uh, one of the Lucky Star movies, you know, where she comes out and just flexes, right? You know, and she, not, she holds... Not Yukari Oshima. Oh, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Would you like me to tell you who that is? Hold on a second. You are correct. I know you're correct. Damn it. Michiko Nishiwaki. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. It's okay. The, the, the thing is... Is it okay? Is it really? <laughs> yes, of course, man. Because uh, Michiko also did a lot more of the, the lower budget ones later on. And I believe kind of may have segued into... And I, they may have done a movie together. Uh, very easy to mix those two up. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Shawaki was in, a in, in this day and age, In this day and age, that's what we want to do is mix things up like this. <laughs> hey, I give you a pass. I am just uh, a nerd. But I, I, you know, the bottom line is you did a lot of research and you went into the, so I'm blaming you, you went into the fact that she did end up going uh, to the Philippines to do some work over there. Mm -hmm. And so you did all the research. So you left me with nothing. So all I could say was, oh, she posed. And oh, no, that's a different uh, Asian woman, Gavin. But it's funny with this list, I almost put on, you know what? She should be on our honorable mentions is Michiko Nishiwaki simply because yeah. of her iconic role in uh, My Lucky Stars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you, I appreciate you bailing me out right now, but the, the truth is they, 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 she's had some really fantastic fight sequences. I really like the Outlaw Brothers fight yes. sequence. And then also the, which, which is the one she is with uh, Moon Lee. That's uh, Kickboxer's Angel. Tears, right? No, that's Angel. Well, no, it's both. It's both. So Angel's the yes. one that made our list. Kickboxer's Tears is the one they did later. Yeah, and that's the one where there isn't Kickboxer's Tears where they're like fighting outside, like on a walkway at some point. Yeah, I mean. They're, they're in like a pit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slowly pulling my foot out of my mouth. But yeah, I mean, obviously she made my list for a reason and it's not because she, uh, I mistook her for the person who flexed on camera. Hey, don't feel bad because when I was saying my uh, number 10, the revolving door of 80s, 90s stunt people, instead of Sophia Crawford, I almost said Sophia Shepard. I wrote it as Sophia Shepard, mixing up Karen Shepard and <laughs> Sophia Crawford. And luckily I caught myself, I was like, Sophie, that's not right. I'm like, Sophia Crawford. I'm, it was late last night and I was like, Whoa. so we all make mistakes, homie. No, we're all right. Okay. So she made, she made our list for the right reasons. Yes. So now we're on number five. Yes. You're number five. My number five. Oh, because you got Yoshima was mine. So my number five is, and I'm assuming he's uh, higher up on your list. Uh, maybe he's your number four. So we'll see. We'll, and he could have been much higher, but I had him settled. I, I had him at like close to one, then 10, and then now he's at five. And that is Sensei Benny the Jet Urquidez. Oh, interesting. He is on my list. Mm -hmm. Not my number four. Not so I'm starting, to wonder, I'm starting to wonder where my number four is on your list. Okay, so he is on your list. So now who's your number four? Uh, Richard Norton. Oh, Richard Norton is higher up on my list. 
he now Richard Norton was my number one, and then uh-huh. I then I flipped he and uh, I flipped anyway. Well, Richard Norton was my number one for a while too. So, anyways, so in that case, my number four, and let's see if he's on your list. Then is Yasuaki Karata. He is on my list, and oh, no. I this is where I was going to put him. I was going to put him at my number one, uh-huh. but he is my number three. Okay, perfect. Wait, right? Yeah. No, what's your number four? Richard. Oh, got it. Okay, which we have to wait to talk about until I get to him. So my number four is your oh, number three. Oh, I think I like your number one. Okay, so either which way, we can talk <laughs> about Yasuaki Karata now. Yes. So for, I, I feel like maybe people that don't even deep dive into the history of this wouldn't even know he's Japanese and from Japan because he's been involved in Hong Kong martial arts cinema from the beginning. And I mean the beginning. His first role was, uh, I believe, The Angry Guest, the Shaw Brothers one, like all the way back in 72. And it's not just like, oh, he'd come and do a movie once in a while. When you look at his filmography, he was just churning them out nonstop, like uh, Hong Kong movies. I mean, popping up in Fist of Unicorn, uh, Kung Fu Inferno, Kung Fu the Invincible Fist, uh, and then also going back to Japan and like doing movies. Uh, famously, he's in The Executioners with Sonny Chiba. I love that film. Uh, a couple of the Sister Street Fighter movies, Dragon Princess, which was another Suchiomi one. And then coming back and doing more Hong Kong ones. But as a performer, he's phenomenal. He's got that karate base, but he also learned to do very much the Kung Fu style choreography, you know, uh, whether you want to call it like the Lao Garlong, or even like the Samuel Hung traditional type stuff, which can be seen in some of his my, most iconic roles. Obviously, for me, I think, well, actually, you know, I think maybe his, for most viewers, his most iconic role would be in Heroes of the East, aka Shaolin Challenges Ninja, uh, and a few other names. Uh, and then obviously, in that, in that movie, he's playing a Japanese fighter. And then he also famously was in Legend of a Fighter, which is the early like version of the story of Ho Yun Ja, aka Fak Yun Gap, which was later made into a movie called Fearless with Jet Li. But for me, I, I think of him in two roles always stand out for me. Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars, which I'm sure for you as well, and then Fist of Legend with Jet Li. And he just had such a wide range of ability to perform. He can do more basic like karate style he can do the kung fu style he can do the kickboxing style which we saw in like eastern condors you know it's very much more of that like hard-hitting kickboxing uh attack and his career is just so prolific you know uh and still to this day i think he still goes and makes movies over there and i know he's had like a karate dojo over there uh I know Sifu, Alex has talked about him on Dudes of Kung Fu before. Uh, The guy speaks fluent Cantonese. He wrote a book on Hong Kong cinema. Uh, Just a very, very talented performer. And he has not only a ton of films in Hong Kong cinema, but very iconic roles and movies. And he's been there since the beginning, almost, like the birth of what would be the Kung Fu Pian or Kung Fu movie as opposed to Wuxia. Uh, all the way up through, you know, the different generations, you know, so the early Shaw brothers to the Lao Garlong Shaw brothers to Golden Harvest, uh, Hong Kong of the 80s to the early 90s with Jet Li. And so he's just a very iconic individual in Hong Kong cinema. I think uh, that's one of the reasons why I, so I've had a lot of people in my number one spot, you know, obviously I had Richard, Richard Norton there and I had uh, Yasuaki there and I really wanted to leave Yasuaki there because I, uh, just because he has touched every single era of Hong Kong cinema uh, and also worked with, I believe every single lead or major star or icon throughout throughout, uh, most of Hong Kong cinema. I- Technically Bruce Lee as well, because he was in 50 years ago. Yeah, (laughs) thank you. And I mean, but I'm, I'm, so obviously he's worked with Bruce Lee. He's worked with uh, Gordon Liu. Uh, he's and I I I love Heroes of the East. Oh yeah. Uh, and, you know you've you've hit uh, him working with uh, um, Samo and Jackie and Yun Biao in um, Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. I loved him in My Lucky Stars when he came out in uh, the bathing suit and he flexed. <laughs> uh, 
Great callback. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will say I also really, I mean, he also was in Eastern Condors, but I really actually appreciate the fight sequence he did that was choreographed by Corey Yoon in So Close. Oh, uh, interesting. See, and once again, that's that later period because now we're in the yeah. 2000s and you've yeah. got a whole new generation, the Shu Chi and a whole different generation of stars. This guy's, I think if I'm doing my math correctly, has, has contributed to Hong Kong cinema for four decades and actively and yeah. i think the only person who can uh the only person who can say that they've delivered over so many decades at such a high quality is perhaps samuel hung i'd agree with you uh, samuel jackie yeah I, I i yeah i know i i kind of omitted jackie I, just because of later films yeah i know i and, and i 100 agree with you yeah yeah so I, I i shouldn't do that but yeah i'm just saying like yasuaki uh, Kurata's like career and uh, quality is I'm not going to say it's equivalent to Samuel's because Samuel's quality I mean yeah I mean and consistency but I'm just saying like to have that lifespan in a physically grueling uh, career and also demanding creativity he's delivered the entire time yeah excellent I mean not much more to be said all right, so that was my number four. That was your that was number three. Three. So, so now who's your three? Really interesting because uh, you only have two more entries and one of them is one of my previous choices. So I don't know how this person didn't make your list or maybe they do, uh, I don't know. My number three is uh, Huang Jing Li. Hold on, let me, uh, let me change my list. <laughs> Like, like I was expecting Wang Ying Sik to not make your list or something, or and I'll, but Huang Jing Li is my number yeah. three. Yeah. And but you know what's funny uh, with <laughs> Yasuaki Karata and Huang Jing Li, I you know I I almost wanted to switch them just because of how long uh, Karata San's career has been in Hong Kong cinema, but I just feel like Huang Jing Li actually has the more iconic roles, uh, you know. His, his roles in Drunken Master and Snake in the Eagle Shadow are, mm -hmm. you know, two of the greatest of all time. Yeah. You know, he had so many other ones. Like, and then sometimes the, the lower budget ones, he was also very famous for, unlike, say, Karata Sun, you know, or I hate to say lower budget, but, you know, like Secret Rivals, Secret Rivals 2, Snuff Bottle Connection. And these are all considered classics among fans of the genre. I mean, he also starred one of his few good guys. And that's the other thing. Huang Jingli is maybe the most recognizable kung fu movie villain amongst anyone in fact i'm going to say he is you know uh yeah, now you're uh, just rubbing it in yes yeah the aforementioned roles i just said you know especially snake in the eagle shadow drunken master uh you know dance the drunk mantis that's one of my top of all time uh but one of my favorite roles of his is one of his few good guy roles that he also directed that film hitman in the hand of buddha which is maybe one of the most underrated. He then did segue later into the 80s. So he also has that unique factor of doing the contemporary films like, you know, Where's Officer Tuba, mm -hmm. uh, both productions such as uh, No Retreat, No Surrender 2. Uh, he was in Millionaire's Express, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, with Karata san uh, And uh, thinking, am I, am I not forgetting any like significant later? Well, Game of Death 2, sorry, my, you know, one of my favorite Kung Fu movies of all time also uh magnificent warriors so he, he just had this prolific career that started you know in the mid 70s you know early 70s technically with some korean films and then he became just iconic as not only the greatest maybe kung fu movie villain but also one of the greatest kickers you know he was on our kicker list and a lot of people's top you know he's the boot master and rightfully so and he he created very famous characters i mean his his villain roles were a lot of the times, you know, what, what was his nickname? Like the silver Fox, because he was mm -hmm. always playing the guys with the long hair and the beard and just a phenomenal martial artist. And he had so many iconic roles and that's why he is as high up on my list as he is. Uh, it, it's, it's an excellent choice. And you know, if, if this is the first YouTube video uh, we post, people are just going to see a dumb smile on my face this whole time while you're talking. It's like, <laughs> Well, here's, here's the deal. I, and the reason why I hold nothing against you is I was expecting something like this to happen to me where I was gonna be like, Oh my God, I forgot about that. Oh my God. No. But guess what? 
you obviously still made a top 10 list with fantastic entries. So it is what it is, homie. No worries. All right. <laughs> yeah. So that's my number three. Uh, Wang okay. Like, sorry. Great. Wang Jing Li. Hey, same surname, right? <laughs> Wang Jing Li. Yeah. Uh, and I may have just said Wang is sick before. I apologize if that's the case. Uh, Wang Jing Li. Uh, even people that aren't familiar with the genre might even recognize him. Like, oh, is it the guy from Drunken Master? But yeah, no, uh, it's, it's he's fantastic. Excellent choice. Yes, thank you, thank you. And still in phenomenal shape to this day. He has a Instagram page now. Oh. Uh, that I believe is managed by one of his students uh, who has a page too. I could be totally wrong. Seems to be a really nice guy. I think he might be from Russia. Very talented Taekwondo kicker, and but like very traditional style. And I think that's why he might be a student. But uh, people can find Wang Jingli now on. Uh, Instagram. So uh, go find him. Uh, yeah, go find him and follow yeah. him. Hopefully he makes some more movies because from what I've seen in recent years, he still can kick quite well. Um, so, all right. So now we're at number two, right? And I think my number two is your number one. Okay. Uh, so who's because you, you've said you've said that Richard is not your number one. Right. So who's Cynthia? Two? Cynthia. Rothwell. There we go. Okay. So oh. this is weird. My number one is your number two. My number two is your number one. So how do we want to tackle this? You so wait, talk about Richard or Cynthia first? No, we haven't talked about Benny. So my number one is Benny. Oh, what the? Oh, wait, where was Richard? N Richard was number four. Whoops. Okay. So uh, I just got ahead of myself. So That's my okay. number two is Richard. Your number. F wait. Yeah. So okay. my four is Richard. Your two is Richard. My two is Cynthia. Your one is Cynthia my one is benny your four is benny okay so who do we talk about first then you want to talk about uh let's talk about benny first okay perfect yeah, just do it in that do that in that order got it so benny we'll, 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 five. End, we'll end with cynthia got it benny is my number five and your number one yeah okay uh fair enough and once again as i said benny was up and down up and down on yeah. mine and could very easily be number one and when i was first starting this list the reason why he was like at first I was like no he can't be number one he only did two iconic roles and one more he's done three hong kong movies we uh that's, Wilson, that's Mil rough by yeah. the way that's hey. rough he's hey. only done two iconic roles wheels on meals the maybe the second greatest fight scene of all time dragons forever another top 10 fight scene of all time and then enter the eagles with yeah. Shannon lee uh so when a lot of people forget about that one and enjoyable the reason why i like that movie is solely because of benny being in it uh but Obviously, he still made my number five because then I went back. I was like, you know what, though? His two fight scenes against Jackie Chan are always in the top 10 one-on-one -on -one fight scenes of all time. You know what I mean? No matter what. Unless you have a rule like we did where Jackie couldn't have two entries, right? But if you're just yeah. going flat out, you can't deny that both of those fight scenes are just so important you know, not just iconic, important in terms of the evolution of fight choreography in Hong Kong cinema. And the the Wheels on Meals one, especially, I mean, it's got to be the Spartan X version, though. We agree on that. Yes. With, with the, the proper soundtrack. Uh, that, that fight scene just, it, I remember first renting that from Hollywood Video in what would be the late 90s and seeing it for the first time, watching it at my dad's house and just, just, it blew me away. I was just mesmerized. And it's, you know, moments like that in cinema, whether it's martial arts or any other genre, they're few and far between. And so when you have something like that, that really resonates with you so deep and sticks with you, it's something special. And it's both of their performances in the fight scene acting wise. Uh, it's their performances, martial arts wise, the execution of the moves, the athleticism, uh, the sincerity behind it. It's just the, even if he had just done the one fight, he'd be a worthy entry on this list. I, and I, technically, well, no, you've actually trained with Sensei Benny. For me, Sensei Benny would be like my, uh, you know, my Shifu Shifu, you know, my Sifu Sifu. Uh, and so my coach is coach. So definitely uh, that extra special connection there as well. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, it's for me, it was my one through four was fluid the entire time, whether, you know, Benny is obviously number one for me. 
And it is because the two iconic roles could, because if you had to, uh, if you had to go back in time and rem and just nominate a couple of films, one of his films would be in there or one of the films that he's in would be in there. Whether that would be Wheels on Mills Spartan X, which has the better fight, or whether that is, hey, this decade is ending. We've had a great run together. The, the three, the three uh, uh, you know, Sammo, Yun Biao, Jackie Chan. The three they're breaking dragon, up The, the three dragons. Whatever you want to call them, yeah. yeah. They're breaking up after this. So we're going to, this is, this Dragons Forever is another kitchen sink movie for me, uh, where we're just going to throw everything in there and let Corey Yoon take care of some of the action. And it's going to be hard action uh one of those two films is going to make it if if you had to pick again like just a few films from every country and just put it in a time capsule one of those one of those two films is going to make it into that time capsule i believe yeah uh one thing that the fight sequences with jackie chan overshadows are the fight sequence or the i should say the kick that he delivers to Sammo Hung. Oh yeah. Cause In you know, and, yes. Yeah. And then the, the sequence with uh, Yun Biao where he just knocks Yun Biao out, right? Near the bulldozer truck? Yeah, so Yun Biao, you, yeah. So he comes around and kicks Yun Biao right in the throat. And so then Yun Biao standing there, gives him the thumbs up, passes out. Yeah. Uh, right, right at, so I mean, just being able to deliver to deliver those two sequences. I mean, Samuel, you know, he's being held. It's a wide target. It's not that, but being able to deliver right to the throat uh, is a phenomenal sequence. Uh, so for me, he's, he, he and Jackie Chan choreographed clearly helped, I would presume. I mean, you're not going to turn away from Samuel Hung. You're not going to just, you know, Samuel Hung's helping, Yuen Biao's helping, Corey Yoon's helping. Just even if they're not directly, everyone's directly involved, there is this the the top people in cinema at the top of their game working together have created two uh bookended the 80s even though spartan x takes place a little into the 80s uh dragons forever is right at 89 um and this reminds me that you know we're talking about foreign performers and i made this note earlier we're talking about foreign performers but a lot of times a lot of these foreign performers have been uh have had Hong Kong stuntmen stepping in for them in sequences. And so it's also a little bit like when we're talking about these guys, uh, we also have to give a little, we definitely have to give a shout out to the stunt performers, the Hong Kong stunt performers who stepped in for them. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, for me, that's, that's why I put Benny at the top because when, when we look at uh, you know Richard Norton, who's gonna have, when we talk about him in a little bit, we're gonna just talk about his prolific career and his quality across the board and his screen presence and everything that he's brought. Uh, but his one-on-one -on -one fight sequences consistently are great, particularly, the, I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but I think when people look back, they're going to remember the, the Benny the Jet fight sequence with, with Jackie Chan. And that's why, that's why I moved them around. Hey, I can't argue with that. Uh, and real quick, honorable mention, probably for Keith Vitale as well, who, yeah, uh, yeah. once again, his only Hong Kong role was Wheels on Meals. And then he did the fantastic super fights, the Hong Kong US co-production where he plays the best villain, but you know, just not a, enough screen time in Hong Kong. But any final thoughts on Sensei Benny? No, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to talk about, I think Richard Norton next, right? You're number two and my yeah. number four. So my number two? And yeah. your number four, Richard Norton was your number four. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. I right. put him that far down. I'm there so you. sorry. No, no, I'm just sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, my number two. Uh, so the reason why Richard Norton goes into my number two. So earlier when I had said, uh, you know, when you first think of like the foreign uh, players in Hong Kong cinema, or you know, the first thing that comes to mind is like the stunt people. You know, my number ten entry, the Mark Houghtons, the Bruce Fontaines, so forth, so forth. But when I think of like the starring roles, the first two people that come to mind are my top two. Uh, and with number two being Richard Norton. And the, the thing I love about Richard Norton is it's almost kind of like his whole cinematic career, like a lot of these guys, it just kind of 
happened inadvertently, right? It almost like fell into his lap. Uh, this was a time period where Samo especially was looking for the best martial artists of different styles, which typically meant finding people outside of Hong Kong and bringing them. And they had such great success with Benny. And through the recommendation, I believe, of Pat Johnson, the American martial artist, uh, stunt director, most famous role as the referee in Karate Kid. Uh, and that's how he had worked with Jackie on the big brawl. So that's like how Benny got recommended. And if I'm not mistaken, that's also how San, uh, excuse me, Richard got recommended. And they actually wanted Richard, if I'm not mistaken, for Wheels on Meals. But at the time, he was bodyguarding for James Taylor in Japan because mm -hmm. uh, he famously was a bodyguard for the stars. And, you know, he wasn't just going to leave in the middle of a, uh, a gig like that. And then so it wasn't until uh, Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars that he was able to get over there and finally work with them. I believe Twinkle Twinkle was the first one, correct? Yeah, you're, you're right. I, I didn't realize it was Wheels on Meals that they were looking for him for, but I know I, he I turned think, out a film. I think if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. But yeah, so Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. And uh, in that you know, role, he could have easily been overshadowed by his, even his other cohorts that are with him, his, like the trio of assassins, Yasuaki Karada, who we already mentioned, who just created that and Chung Fat or Fat Chung. Uh, but instead, he's really like steals the show in the finale with his fight scene with Samo. And it's just so hard hitting, like the, the uppercut to the jaw. And when, when he kicks Samo and, you know, we get, that's the first time we get his iconic line of painful. But, you know, uh, it, and so from there, he was still doing movies in the West. And then it's like his roles kept getting bigger and bigger, or, you know, he does the Millionaire's Express with Cynthia, right? Then he does Magic Crystal. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, he didn't have as many Hong Kong movies as some of these other ones, but his performances were just phenomenal, especially the highly underrated Magic Crystal. The, and that when you think about it, most of the, the heavy duty fight scene action in that film is handled by two foreigners, Cynthia and Richard. And he also, even though they kind of joke about it in interviews and sometimes, he showed diversity in the fact that he was able to do some of the more like Chinese style martial arts stuff. Uh, and that was a terrible Kung Fu impression right there uh, that I just did. But he does kind of like this, like, you know, mantis hands thing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. You're right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, and, and now I've lost my, my train of thought. Uh, but also, and famously, Jackie, you know, has re-invited him back. You know, he worked, he fought him briefly in Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars, invites him back for City Hunter, invites, invites him back again for Mr. Nice Guy. And yeah. that's not very often where, you know, especially as kind of more of a co-star with these foreigners that it's like, you know, obviously Benny was invited back, but Richard, they specifically wanted him back. Jackie wanted Richard. And we all know what a perfectionist Jackie is, even more so than Samo and kind of, I hate to say nitpicky, but you know, he's very particular about who he wants in his movies and you know, he wants to make the best roles. And the fact that he would go out of his way to bring Richard back uh, two times. And unfortunately, the only reason we didn't get a proper fight scene between him and Jackie on Mr. Nice Guy was uh, they went, they were pretty much going over budget and ran out of time. It's, it's, and it was, it, if I'm not mistaken, it was the American producers who shut that down. Yeah, I think that's something. It's, we, it's, I, I, I am to this day extremely upset because at that point in Richard's career, he was at under the gun fit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was, he was kind of at a weird, like, uh, second peak almost, you might say. And th that's what's, that's what's phenomenal. So I, I, we can get into this segment, uh, this part of the conversation a little bit too, but he's had multiple peaks past period past uh what you would expect in someone's life right and for him to come in and and like be at that level uh during mr nice guy and under the gun uh i really feel that like new line cinema owes fans an apology and it's just kind of silly of me to say that but yeah in our in our that they, they really i mean even the sequence where jackie chan is tied up and richard's like punching him uh his form is so good. Uh, and the beating that Jackie takes is great. And then, you know, he releases him and punches him one time, yeah. but it's such, you know, they set up, that movie would have, would, could have made it 
uh, to a top 10 list, I think, if there had been a final final fight. Yeah. Um, because the construction fight scene in that is one of the best Jackie's ever done. It's so good. It, it's, and it is, it is like, it's a throwback to, uh, to old cinema. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think I've actually gone publicly and stated that New Line Cinema owes fans an apology because you can't go back to that. You can't go back to a point because, uh, I'm going off the top of my head here, at what point was Mr. Nice Guy made? That was after Rumble in the Bronx, right? Yes, it was 97, if I'm not mistaken. So, so yeah, Jackie Chan is uh, entering that, uh, that fitness level of uh, gorgeous. So he's entering yeah. that peak in his career. And you have Richard entering in the peak of his under the gun career. And you can't get that back. Uh, you can have it at another, you know, but that was, that was, that was a perfect storm. And, and uh, anyway, we're talking about the top 10 performers, not New Line Cinema's <laughs> apology that they owe us. Yeah, um, but, uh, I, if, I couldn't agree with you uh, more on all that. And the best part is how over the top he is in that role as Gene Carlo. And I always thought it was great, but he's talking about interviews. He's like, hey, God, Samo, you know, made me act so <laughs> over the top. And it's like, you know, he's just like, what, what, what's with the cigars and, you know, the suit and everything. And even Jackie saw the suit. Why are you wearing such a terrible suit? And, but he just, he pulled it off. It's like, you could tell yeah. he didn't want to be, because in comparison to say a film like Under the Gun shot around the same time, you see Richard getting to act for real. He's a great actor. Yeah. But in that movie, it's like, he's, he's literally, ah, 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 you know, it, because that's what they told him to do. And it's like, all right, you know, you're the boss. You know, you know, uh, if I were an impartial, if this were a grand jury and we're presenting our case to- uh, New Line? No, no, not to New Line. I'm over New Line, man, forget that. Oh, okay. uh, no, if we're, if we're presenting our case to a, a grand jury and basically saying, okay, so who is the true number two and who's the true number four? Uh -huh. uh, based on something you said, uh, Richard Norton should be in second place and um, Benny should be dropped, and I'll tell you why. Because you're absolutely right. Jackie Chan is a perfectionist, and to invite somebody back that many times, whereas I believe that Benny, Sensei Benny, uh, was invited uh, back because it was the culmination of the decade, and that was Jackie's best fight. So they have, you know, if you look at the cast that uh, Jackie makes his way through, from even the henchmen that come on to the boat. Uh, sequence it's about everybody he's fought and everybody he's beaten so he's just beating everybody he's already yeah. beaten in that decade so i, I wow. mean that sounds so based on that argument uh i think my list is off and your list is right when it comes to the placement of of uh benny and richard because to be invited back that many times just goes to show and then if we were having a conversation of well what's their film career like outside of Hong Kong, then I mean, forget about it. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank and, you, my friend. Uh, oh, and, and if I can say one more thing about Richard, what I really, uh, so when I was growing up in Japan and I was watching these films, when I saw Richard, I'm like, I see someone like me. I can, re I can relate and I wanted to be like him, Yeah. you know? And so when I got to meet him, for, you know, it's like, I, I could hardly talk. And, you know, yeah. he's the one who broke the ice, but, uh, um, and when I came back to the States and I was like looking at, you know, TV guide, like what's playing. Cause we had HBO free for a week. Like what's playing rage and honor, rage and honor. And it's like Norton Ross rock. I'm like, I know those names from Japan, yeah. right. From Hong Kong cinema. And so I like stayed up late and like watched it. And I was like, this is the movie that, you know, got, I got sick the next day so I could rewatch the, the <laughs> replay. <laughs> but yeah, is so for me, like he's, it was hard not to put him in first place, but I, I was trying to use my brain logically and, now seeing your logic and your argument, definitely you you have you have them in the right spot. All righty then. So let's go to your number two and my number one. Yes. It's Cynthia Rothrock. Yeah. And I think the the interesting part about Cynthia Rothrock is like Richard, like I just said, like a lot of these foreign performers, it, it wasn't, you know, a film career wasn't necessarily what she was aiming for it kind of just happened right so she had been five years undefeated world weapons and forms champion uh you know she's an expert at wushu and tong sudo and really golden harvest was in america looking for the next bruce lee and so they reached out to i believe it was ernie reyes west coast stunt team 
uh, which she like performed with about if they had any guys they thought could come in audition and stuff. And they said, well, yeah, well, can we bring the girls too? And it's like, well, yeah, I guess, but we're not going to hire them. So, you know, the odds were already stacked against her, right? She shows up and like her martial arts career where she was competing against men for years before they had a women's division for weapons and forms. She, she outperforms them and changes the minds of these film executives or recruiters or producers, whoever they were, which as we know, they can be, definitely be stubborn individuals. They completely change their plan and they're like, all right, we'll take her. So it's already a male dominated genre at this point. Cause you have to remember, this is before the resurgence of the girls with guns subgenre, right? So female empowered action roles haven't really been around at this point for over a decade. You know, the wuxia pictures of the sixties were very uh, female driven as were some of the early Kung Fu Pian, but really post Bruce Lee, it was kind of highly masculinized the Kung Fu movie genre. Then there was obviously uh, female driven pictures as well but let's be honest it was mostly male dominated so for her to already right there kind of stake her claim as like the next big star was something so she comes over she headlines her first movie right uh yes madam with michelle yo another kind of at that point not well-known person and they make not only do they headline this movie together they are the stars of it it's a female driven action picture that does very well and is one of the greatest Hong Kong action movies ever made. The finale is maybe the best finale of all time. They launch a whole movement, the Girls with Guns subgenre, right? Which becomes huge for the next, you know, we'll say like five to six years. Uh, and she goes on to be a prolific actor in Hong Kong. She has great supporting roles, uh, you know, in something like, uh, Inspector wears skirt. She has great ensemble roles, like in Magic Crystal, where she's an ensemble lead, uh, you know, and also Millionaire's Express. But then she becomes pretty much of that of that era, and you know, not to take away from Mr. Ron Van Cleef I mentioned before, but really becomes the first foreigner to headline a major Hong Kong release. Like this is a Hong Kong film, not a co-production, not a low budget thing. When she is the star the one and only star of, uh, not Inspector Wars, excuse me, Lady Reporter, AKA the Blonde Fury. And, uh, you know, Golden Harvest liked her enough that they tried to launch her more of a Hong Kong type career in America with the China O'Brien movies, uh, which I loved, you know, that didn't really pan out that way, but she did go on to have the, maybe one of the most prolific straight to video uh, action careers in America of all the martial arts stars. She did come back and do some more Hong Kong movies, uh, City Cops, Prince of the Sun, so her, her, she never did like, even those last two city cops and Prince of the sun, they're, you know, not as good as the earlier ones, but still she never did like a bad movie and she's in some of the most iconic roles and she created, you know, her own, I shouldn't say created, but she was the star of her own film where it's like, that is Cynthia Rothrock's movie. She is a white woman headlining a Hong Kong martial arts picture. Something like that has it had never been done. It hasn't been done since. I don't ever see it happening again. And as a performer, she's incredible. And Scott Atkins talked about this on his interview with her on his YouTube show where uh, and he said not to talk, take away from any other female performers, but I think it's something that's, uh, she just generates so much power and so much believability in her technique. Like when she kicks, uh, you, you, it's, any of her contemporaries, male or female, uh, it's hard to compare. She's just so good. And I feel like actually Michelle Yeoh is very similar with her. And that's why they paired up so well in that film. They just know how to sell their techniques. And uh, not only that, you know, obviously she has the Tong Sudo background for kicking and punching, but she has that traditional Chinese martial arts background. So her weapons work and stuff and say something like uh, Magic Crystal, it's, it's, it's probably better than a lot of the local Hong Kong guys you know, the, her wushu and stuff like that. And, you know, she, in uh, Inspector Wears Skirt, like her whole sequence with Jeff Falcone, right? They do mm -hmm. like the traditional martial arts stuff. And if I'm not mistaken, she does like a, you know, whole eagle claw type thing. And she just went to show, I can do contemporary, I can do traditional. Could you imagine if she got to make like a traditional Kung Fu movie? That would have been so cool. But I just, when I think like foreign performers in Hong Kong cinema, like stars, she is like the first one that comes to my mind. And I, I, I rest my case. Uh, take, uh, 
yeah, she she is uh, she helps define an era because if you if you walk a if you look back on the eighties and you look back at uh, you know again I can I can go back to my number one my original number one pick Benny the Jet uh, those are fights right these are these are great fights he's in he not saying he doesn't carry a film he was never given an opportunity to carry a film necessarily okay. Cynthia Rothrock carries a film and also okay. she is uh, her performance is a moral compass in a very immoral film uh, above the law. She is, she is the driving force, the moral compass through the film. Now, mind you, Yoon Biao also thinks, his character also believes that he's the moral compass, but she is the, you know, in, in the world of white and black and all the gray in between, she is, she is the pure white and the, the, the chief of police is the pure black and Yoon Biao and everybody else is in between here. Uh, she, her performance, she carried, I mean, each, per, each person carried their performance, but she carried, without her, that film, I don't think would work. It would just be, it would fall. She stole the show. I mean, Yuen Biao, obviously, the, the ending fight with Melvin Wong is phenomenal. His fight with Petey is fantastic. It's, you know, I wish it could have been longer. But her sequences, I, I feel like all of her sequences are top notch. And I, yeah. you know, for example, her part of the finale, that group yeah. fight, which is yes. supposedly ghost choreographed by Samo, uh, is fantastic. And I feel like better than, say, even the parking lot fight scene for UNBL. Mm -hmm. uh, her fight scene with Karen Shepard is, 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 is as good. I may even go say it's better than UNBL's fight scene with Sensei uh, Petey. You know, it's just, and once again, she gets to use that kind of traditional Chinese martial arts with the pole, right? Yeah, uh, and yes, I, I, lo I love I love the fight sequence that uh, where she almost catches Yun Biao at the house, and then oh, you know, duh, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. But her, 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 you know, it's so all of a sudden we're just talking one film here, and we've yeah. talked about three iconic fight scenes in the film, and then her death in the film. You know, she can also act. I don't know about some of these the other people we've mentioned on our list. I mean, they they they're all actors, they're all performers, but I'm just saying like there's a reason she's your number one and she was, you know, my number two and, and honestly should be my number one. Uh, but just her, her death sequence, you know, it's heartbreaking. There's a lot of heartbreak in that movie. And then, but that is the icing on the cake that, that is like the most evil person possibly on film has killed the best person possibly on film. And, uh, you know, you just watched Rage and Honor, right? Mm-hmm. And I know we're talking about their Hong Kong films, but if you look at uh, uh, Rage and Honor, there's a sequence where the police chief is talking to Richard Norton's, Norton's character, Preston Michaels. Yes, I know the character's name. <laughs> uh, and she says, don't let her, don't let, be careful, don't let her cute uh, stuff fool you or something like that. And then Cynthia walks up and she's like, you know, she's like playing, she, she has layers to her acting, which is really great. And, you know, it's sort of like what you were talking about with, uh, Benny the Jet referring to Sensei Petey, you know, you're a performer. She was a performer and she was an A caliber star in, in the best action uh, of the 80s. And, you know. The other thing to keep in mind is also in all these Hong Kong roles, she's acting in a language she doesn't even speak. You know, so yeah. they try to give her phonetically either the Cantonese if it was simple enough or something phonetically that sounded similar. So she's not even like saying the, the real dialogue. She's just kind of having to emote what she's supposed to be feeling, you know, and she mm -hmm. could literally be saying like, Mary had a little lamb, you know? And so it makes it even harder to perform yeah. under those uh, circumstances. Yeah, so I, I think she's, you know, uh, if you go back and look at the eighties, you're definitely going to pull out a few key names. You're going to pull out Samo, Yun Biao, Jackie Chan. You're also going to pull out Frankie Chan. You're going to pull out some other yeah. great, great names who, who carried, not just carried, but like broke barriers in the action genre. And she's one of them. A hundred percent agree. And that's why she made my number one. And uh, yeah, I mean, really, it, it's so funny. It's making me so, it's so nostalgic and making me, yearn for the hong kong movies of old right yeah uh, and i would love to see more actual like hong kong made action films but i'd also be very open to you know chinese productions made in the same style but that's never going to be the case and unfortunately you know when when politics gets involved 
uh, and I don't mean like a necessarily a political message behind the movies, but just literally when you have a, a communist regime, uh, there's going to be certain rules that you have to follow when making a movie. And so I feel like we'll never really be able to get these kind of movies again. Uh, but we can only hope, you know, that yeah. once in a while we'll get a gem. Yeah. Um, this, this has been a fun, this has been a fun podcast. I, I have a parting thought that isn't related to this, uh, to this list, but to another list we once did. Okay. If you want it, I'll give it yeah. to you. Let's okay. Go. Top, remember the top 10, like chase scenes or top five chase yeah. scenes. Yes. So I want to update it and just say my top, my number one top chase scene is Mr. Nice Guy. Wow. You Cause you're just what? running. The whole movie is running. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why we didn't think of that. I, yeah. Maybe the, the, the boundaries we had set, like going from one significant spot to the next. You know what? I think that's why we kind of said that because even the construction fight scene, they're just running up and down like the building, right? Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think you're In right. Theory. I mean, well, he's, he's like running away the whole time. Too. Yeah, he's just, <laughs> you said it best. So he's just good at running away. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, any final thoughts? A uh, great list. And I think uh, your research came through on a couple of those picks there. Um, really nice, really nice list. And it made me, made me reconsider my, I, I was very, it's funny coming into this. I was like my one through four are set and then everything <laughs> below, but like everything below, well, yeah, it's good. And then like my one through four, after hearing yours, it's like same, same, almost the same four people. Right. Uh, I missed one glaring error, but uh, just different order. And it's yeah. nice. Yeah. Good job us. So we'll have to figure out our uh, next one uh could be just a regular film or a list we'll have to discuss but otherwise great to be back likewise yeah very good to be back all right peace out brother okay.